Hi, I'm Seamus from Outdoors Inspiration. This is my German Shepherd, Petra. Welcome to Outdoors Inspiration Outdoor Essentials. Today we're going to look at stoves, backpacking stoves. But I'm going to be clear, I'm looking at backpacking stoves from my perspective and my viewpoint. They're not reviews. Other people will have other opinions and other ideas. And I'm going to look at typically the type and range of different stoves that I've used over the years. There are many different types and styles of cooking systems out there. What you need is something that's going to cook what you need to eat effectively, that it's light and portable enough for you to carry. There are a variety of different types of fuel available for backpacking stoves. Solid fuels. Well, my early days in the military taught me what hexamine smelt like and I didn't particularly like it. And uh, I know that there's lots of other products available, but I don't use solid fuel stoves uh, in that respect. And then of course we've got uh, multi-fuel stoves that might burn say petrol or uh, uh, Coleman fuel. Um, and I've spent uh, literally hundreds of days uh, in sub-zero temperatures cooking with kerosene on a traditional pump action primer stove. Multi-fuel stoves are fantastic if you need to maintain your cooking system uh, and you need a variety of fuels that may be available to you. I'm not in that position. I don't need that anymore. Uh, so I steer clear of those uh, stoves. I tried uh, backpacking with a, uh, an MSR Whisper Light, but I avoid it now because um, it was too heavy and clumsy for what I needed. I needed something very simple, to be honest with you. And then, of course, there's always an open fire. Making a fire, burning wood. Well, that isn't possible on Dartmoor. It's against the law. So I don't make fires or build fires within Dartmoor National Park. So that leaves us with meths burners or alcohol burners and, uh, and gas stoves. I prefer to use gas, I find it a lot cleaner and uh, tromping about the moors with Petra, I find it a lot safer because if I've got an alcohol burner that's not on a stable base and she knocked it over, um, then we may have a running fuel fire. So from my personal perspective, I prefer gas, but that doesn't mean to say that any of those other options aren't reasonable options to use. It's down to you and your personal preference what you want to carry. But we'll talk through some of the alcohol burners as well. The first stove we look at is the Trangia. Many of us know and love these because we've carried them with youth groups in the past, uh, either guiding the youth groups or as youths ourselves. I was one once. Uh, this is the Trangia 25 series. It's the bigger one. So this is intended uh, for three to four people. It's quite large and bulky. Um, the Trangia 27 series is intended for one or two people. Um, I use this one for car camping, or effectively if I'm turning up at a campsite with my tent, I can use this as a nice big stable platform and I can do plenty of decent cooking in it. Um, they nest, the trenches. So there's our lid, that lid also becomes a frying pan. You can get accessories for the trenger. So this is a chopping board and a strainer. There's our pot handle or pot grab. Always, <laughs> and I never use it, you end up with a kettle as well. And then there's the pots. So there's usually two pots with them. This is the non-stick version. Uh, quite luxurious really for a nice car camp while I'm away. The two remaining parts form the base for the burner and the windshield and pan support. Quite ingenious. Uh, Trangia, if you've ever wondered where the name came from from Trangia, it was a place. Trangia is Trange in aluminium. Not a lot of people know that. So the Trangia is traditionally a spirit burner. It burns meths uh, in one of these style burners. It has a screw lid to seal it. It's often a bad seal and that's another reason why I don't like them is because you end up with everything inside your bag smelling of meths to be honest with you. I know I'll get criticism, I'll get flack, there'll be people who love these but it's how I feel about them. <laughs> We've got to take what we feel comfortable with. And there's a snuffer as well. So um, once it's lit and burning you can control the flame with a limited aperture here uh, to simmer with. Let's have a little look at that. Right, so the spirit burner goes in here, windshield around. There we go. Sometimes it's difficult to see the flame. You can be unsure whether it's lit. That is lit. 
So the flame can then be controlled using the simmer ring to the amount that you want to come out of there. Or it can be snuffed out completely with this. Or to be honest with you, you can just snuff it out with the lid. Now these, um, these burners depend on these little jet holes around here. And the meths has to get to a temperature that it will vaporise and jet through those holes. So actually it's not liquid coming out of there, it's vaporised uh, meths or alcohol that's coming through. And that's the same with all the alcohol burners. So there we go, it's, uh, it'll jet up in a minute, but uh, I can effectively control the heat with this. Or we can snuff it out with the lid. So my preference uh, with the Tranger, I'm afraid, is the lazy man's option. I can't be doing my faffing about with, uh, with methylated spirit, so I would use uh, a gas converter for that. Um, these are uh, quite expensive, I suppose, to buy at about, um, I think about 40 or 50 pounds. Uh, I may be wrong, maybe 30 pounds, but effectively it clips into the burner uh, stand here. Comes out here. It actually lives inside my kettle, believe it or not, <laughs> when the transi is packed away. And uh, now you've got a gas stove sat there with a preheat tube. And we'll talk about preheat tubes in just a second. So this now converts the transi into a gas stove. And it's actually blowing quite hard out here today. And that's making a really effective windshield. And there we go, ready to make a cup of tea. One of the benefits of carrying an alcohol burner or meth stove uh, is the fuel. Now, I'm not fond of the smell of it. I'm sure that there are those people who are artificers in the use of alcohol burners who, uh, who know how to contain this stuff properly. I always end up with, it dribb with dribbles of it somewhere. In fact, the, uh, the burner that I brought out with me today managed to somehow leak into the plastic bag that I brought it with. Um, but nonetheless, it's a really valid way of cooking and a really valid way of, of transporting your fuel. The amount of heating time that this would produce far outweighs that of a gas canister. Now, this gas canister, in reasonable temperature conditions, warm temperature conditions, and we'll talk about the temperature and the gas in just a moment, will probably last between two to three hours maximum, depending on whose gas you're using. Uh, there is gas and there is gas. Um, there are various mixtures. This might last you a great deal longer and it might be more readily available wherever it is that you're hiking. There are all manner of alcohol stoves available on the market. Some are very, very expensive, some less so. I can't remember what this one cost me, about eight pounds, all the way from AliExpress in China. Uh, it's a titanium knockoff of somebody else's product, uh, I'll be honest with you. Um, I don't think it's worthwhile going for the cheap knockoffs. I did a test at home with this particular burner once it arrived, and after about mm, 12 minutes, uh, of burning time and it ran out of fuel. It still failed to boil the pot of water that I put on it with about 400 mils in it. Um, eventually, I think after something somewhere, I gave up hope, somewhere between uh, 17 and 20 minutes, it eventually boiled the water for me. Um, so I was a bit disappointed in it, to be honest with you. Um, I mean, it's a light enough thing. It's made of titanium. I put it down here. Two cross pan supports. Very simple to use, and you could use these with any alcohol burner, to be honest with you. Into here. I need to wait for the meths to vaporise and come out of these holes as a, as a lit vapour. So it needs to warm up first. We'll get a windshield around that. There we go, and it's just starting to vaporise now and starting to jet. Now, as I said, this isn't the be-all and end-all. This was a cheap Chinese knockoff. It's, if you're going to go for an alcohol burner, it's worthwhile doing it right from the start. Talk to somebody who understands these things a little bit better than me. But uh, a good windshield is a necessity. That was a cheap uh, aluminium one. It's all, I ever, uh, all I've ever needed. But uh, if you're going to heat this up and use some sort of cone around it, around your cooking pot as well, you've got a nice little cooking system there that's fairly lightweight. That's the chief bonus of this particular burner is it weighs next to nothing. But I did have one glorious moment where uh, I saw a mess burner that I really fell in love with. And this is from Alpkit. It's called the Bruler. 
Um, and I really like it. I mean, it's, it's heavy. I mean, the ultra lighters wouldn't look at this. They, you know, it's it's too it's too bulky. But uh, it's got lovely little legs that poke out. It's a lovely little system. Then you've got your pan support that comes up here, and it's got a limited windshield around this side with a burner and a simmer ring. Let's have a look and see how this operates. There we go. Just as the rain came out, <laughs> it started to jet. It's a lovely little burner, this. It takes about, um, I think it was about, I, I'm, I'm not fussed. If you're burning with alcohol, um, you shouldn't be fussed about the time. It's about seven or eight minutes to boil a pan full of water, or about 400 mils of water, I think. Um, that will jet a little bit more consistently in a minute. It's just in a breeze. Now, I've mentioned several times the boil time, how long it takes to boil a pan of water, and it's fairly unimportant really isn't it um, everybody gets obsessed with it and you look at different burners and I'll, I'll state times of burners that the manufacturers have stated but let's face it it's autumn now winter will soon be here what else are you going to do it's dark at five o'clock so <laughs> if it takes three and a half minutes or it takes eight minutes to boil your pan of water does it matter and there's something quite satisfying i think for those people that prefer alcohol burners to sit there with a real flame a naked flame uh, boiling water or cooking their food on a pan with it now i like that little stove i've used it a few times um, and i quite enjoy using it i don't know why it's something about the intuitive design of it, it makes it uh, come alive for me now i've mentioned windshield several times already i just carry this basic aluminium one uh, there are more bespoke things that are available. But let's be honest, in a, in a landscape like this, um, that's surrounded by tinners, girts and rocks, it's not beyond your own capability just to uh, move a couple of rocks slightly. I mean, small rocks and, and make your own uh, windshield or get in behind a wall, uh, whatever it is. You don't have to cook out in the open and just waste, waste fuel, obviously. So be a bit savvy about it. Think about it. Think about where you're going to cook and where you've got the best shelter to cook from. So this is a 230 gram gas cartridge. So I'm going to talk about gas stoves now and the various types that are available to go with your cooking system. So both butane and propane are LPG, they're li liquid petroleum gas. So it's actually, if you can hear that on the microphone, it's a, it's a liquid that's inside there. And that's because the gas has been pressurised in there. And I think butane actually boils off at something like minus half a degree Celsius. So if you expose this to the atmosphere, it would just boil off instantly. So that means as the liquid is exposed to the atmosphere, it boils off and it comes out as gas. One other phenomenon is that as the gas starts to lift off from the LPG and the volume starts to go down, that evaporative process cools the LPG down. So the canister starts to cool down as well. And that's important because as it cools down, the molecules are less active. So it means it's got less force in the jet. And if it's already a cold day, that might actually make your gas feel a little bit sluggish. So first of all, let's look at canister top stoves. This is my favourite one. It's a little one from Primus. Uh, it's called the Primus Express now. When I bought this uh, many years ago, because this one has lasted me for about 11, 12 years, uh, it was originally called uh, the Primus Micron. Um, let's get it onto some gas. As you screw it on, if you're new to this kind of thing, don't worry about it, there will be a little release of gas there. This particular canister top stove comes with a piezo igniter. Some of them do. This one's always ignited for me, but always come with a backup. Come with a fully charged lighter, matches, uh, or possibly even a fire starter, fire steel. There we go, first time every time. The benefits of this particular stove is that it's portable, small, lightweight, fits in your pocket, um, no bother at all. There's lots of them available. Um, they range from about uh, £40 right the way to £5 if you want to get one direct from China um, or off of eBay. I would recommend going with a reputable firm because you don't know how good that seal is. Once it's connected to your gas canister, you don't want to have any mishaps or flamethrowers chucking flames across your tent, do you? So when folded away, This stove takes up no space whatsoever. Brilliant. Love it to bits. However, I've been out shopping. Uh, I figured after 11 or 12 years it was time for a replacement. So I bought an MSR Pocket Rocket 2. 
This is lovely, it's got double action legs. Unfolds here, lovely little wire controller for the gas. This wind clip system aids the burner in strong winds as well. So uh, I happen to have Primus gas here with a Primus uh, Micron stove. Um, they're interchangeable, it doesn't matter. The fact that I'm putting MSR on MSR isn't OCD, it's just what I happen to pick out of the box tonight. So uh, there we go, MSR Pocket Rocket 2. Beautiful stove, burns fantastically. Let's have a little look at this. This stove has got great controllability. The controllability a word? I don't know. But uh, from jet engine through to a gentle simmer, although there's quite a strong breeze, the wind clip system is doing a great job of keeping the flame regulated and controlled. Ha <laughs> ha! Right, now is the opportunity to talk about our great giveaway on this channel. Have a look in the link below. I'm going to put a link in below to one of my videos and you could win a brand new Pocket Rocket 2 at the end of this month. I've got one to give away. I bought one for myself and I've got a brand new boxed one ready to go for the lucky winner and subscriber. So, um, please, <laughs> I hate to sound like some commercial. I'm not sponsored in any way by these people. Uh, this is out of my own pocket. This is a way to say thank you to subscribers and help promote the channel a bit. That's all it is. So it's a brand new one that I've got in a box, ready to go, end of the month, I'll have a draw, um, and uh, one lucky subscriber will win that. So uh, have a go, look for the link below for the MSR Pocket Rocket 2. Before we get on to talk about these bad boys, jet boils, they're very good at what they do. Uh, they're very compact and they're very, very popular. However, there is an advantage to having a canister top stove over something like the jet boil. And that's that it's modular. You can put whatever pan you want on it. There's a 1.3 litre pan. Uh, and that goes nicely with that particular stove. Uh, this is a one litre pan. That goes nicely with that particular stove. This is a 900 mil pan, titanium. And this one is 475 mils MSR stowaway. And that's quite happy on there. And I can adjust the flame to suit the particular uh, pan that I want. But with the jet boil stove, I'm stuck with that. And it's got to be that shape, <laughs> unless I upgrade. So for one particular uh, trip, I bought the jet boil sumo because I knew that I had to do several meals out of one pot. Um, they're not cheap. The sumo pots are not cheap, but it does increase the volume of a jet boil system. So there we go. We lift the lid. And we've got a burner inside. This is a very old jet boil, by the way. This is one of the originals. Um, my son Angus carries a jet boil. He has the... Uh, flash, I think it's Jetboil Flash. I don't know where that sits in the particular scheme of things with Jetboils at the moment. Um, and then you attach your gas canister. So with the Jetboil, you have to, if you want to nest your canister, with this particular standard Jetboil, this is one of the older ones, by the way, um, you have to use a 100 gram canister. A 230 gram will not fit. Of course, you can attach it to a 230 gram. You can carry the 230 gram separately, but if you want it to nest inside, which it was intended to do as a system, you have to pack a 100 gram in there. That will fit. Now, there are limitations to that because, again, as we spoke earlier on, as this cools down, evaporates off, as it loses pressure inside, um, it's going to start to become uh, a little bit more reluctant to burn. And that is a limitation in cold weather with any canister top system. So one of the unique selling points of the jet boil uh, is, are these flux rings in here. Uh, that is a folded element of metal in there, which gives an effective greater surface area to the bottom of the pan, which should allow the boiling time to be lessened and the pan to gain uh, greater temperature effectively on the bottom of it. There will be a little release of gas as you put it on. Um, I know they're popular, they are successful, um, they do a great job, uh, but they are a little bit more bulky and a little bit more heavy. So, to make it work, we fill our jet boil with water, and there's a bayonet fitting, which I always find particularly fiddly, that goes on there. 
We then boil the water. The cap can rest on top. It's surrounded by neoprene which gives it some thermal protection so that when you finish boiling the water you can disconnect it. I generally find at this point it all gets a little bit sticky. It kind of says it in the name, doesn't it? Jet and boil. That's good marketing, by the way, isn't it? Jet and boil. Um, you think it's a really fast burn time. It's not the fastest uh, of, all the, uh, of all the gas stoves. There are things that, uh, that leave this standing, but it is very effective. They are very effective stoves, and if you had to just have one go-to gas canister top stove uh, without having to worry about what pan you're going to use and everything else, the jet boil is pretty effective at that. It's a go-to kind of option, isn't it? And let's face it, we all like things that just kind of go together, really. It's not going to be your lightest option, but I'll tell you what, it's certainly a compact, usable option. Like I said, this is one of the earlier versions. I haven't uprated it because I don't really use it anymore. I've got so many other options. But my son Angus uses a jet boil flash. It's very effective um, and he uses it every time we go wild camping. So I mentioned earlier on that as the gas lifts off of this, the pressure is obviously lessened. Um, and that process starts to cool down the canister. And have you ever felt that on a gas canister, how it starts to get cold? Well. Is that a problem? Yes, because as it becomes colder, the gas is less uh, volatile, or the LPG is less volatile and less likely to give off gas. So as you lose volume in the canister, you'll find that your flame becomes very, very sluggish and sometimes will fail to boil a pan of water. Now that's the benefit of having 230 grams versus 100 grams, because obviously there's a lot more in here. But on a cold winter's morning, don't be going out with half a canister and thinking you're going to get a good hour's burn out of it because actually it'll become sluggish a lot, lot sooner than that. You can affect that by keeping the canister warm. Put it in your bag with you. Wrap it in your jacket. Keep it inside the tent and warm before you use it. Insulate it from the ground. An old piece of closed cell foam matting cut to a circle to keep it off the ground will help insulate it and that stop that cooling process so that the gas is more effective. If you tried to invert a gas canister and just run LPG straight out of it rather than gas, it would flare and probably burn your hand. It's certainly going to burn something around you. Now when I took the Tranger out earlier on and I put the gas converter into it, I mentioned that there was a preheat tube on here. So the preheat tube heats up the LPG so that it vaporises and comes out as a gas. That means that you could invert the canister on the end of here, even in cold temperatures, and allow LPG just to run through. Should we have a little look at that? Enter the remote canister stove. There we go. This is one from Fire Maple. It's a titanium stove, and it actually has a preheat tube just here. So that again allows me to operate it on LPG in liquid mode when it's very, very cold um, and it will help vaporise the uh, LPG into gas so that it can operate that way. So there we go, operating normally with gas. But now, and if you watch the flame, I'm running it on LPG. So the LPG is coming out as a liquid through the preheat tube, which is vaporising it because it's nice and hot, and coming out burning as gas from the stove. Now, don't be surprised if there's LPG when you turn it off, as I have now, that it continues to burn because there's still liquid in the tube waiting to be burnt off. The canister is now switched off, but I've lost that control. It'll come down eventually. So I started out with this Outdoors Inspiration Outdoor Essentials session by saying that you need to carry what you're comfortable carrying. Carry what's effective to cook what you want to eat and is light and portable enough for you to carry it. These are just my opinions on some of this kit with some technical, sp <laughs> a sprinkling of technical information. And I can tell you that's the limit of my technical know-how. I'm not an expert in this stuff. I just know some bits. That's the truth of it. 
Right, so what do I carry? What would I carry? And what will I continue to carry? For me, the number one, because of the type of backpacking I do, which is now short trips, I've been out for uh, a month at a time living off of kerosene burners, um, and I don't need to do that anymore. I like a couple of days on Dartmoor um, and a comfortable cook time with the equipment that I'm using. My go-to stoves now are the MSR Pocket Rocket 2 and the Fire Maple remote canister stove. So there we go. For most occasions, uh, I'll take the MSR Pocket Rocket 2 with a 900 kettle. Quite happy with that. If I'm taking the Fire Maple, I tend to take the 1300 uh, titanium pot. Um, and that's just the way I am. That's where, where the way that I, uh, I see things in terms of my cooking for what I want. Uh, the Fire Maple, I think, is beautiful. Of course, when you take it with the titanium pot at 1300 mils it's a little bit bigger a little bit more bulky and this is a bit heavier uh, a burner than the pocket rocket 2. Uh, so a nice compact system is the pocket rocket 2 gas canister all packed inside the 900 mil bob's your uncle uh, with this, I can put this with uh, some food and other essentials inside the 1300 mil pot and I carry the gas canister separately, so it takes up a little bit more space. Uh, in terms of the weights of the pans, um, these are good pans. This one's from Outkit, the Outkit 900, uh, the um, Mighty I Mug, uh, and this one here from Evernew. This is actually lighter than the Outkit. Uh, this is real premium kind of uh, titanium stuff, but. There is a price to pay for carrying such lightweight kit, and that's the flexibility on this. If I were to sit on this or to, to knock it in any way, uh, it'll certainly dent. So having something a little bit more robust um, sometimes can pay off. So, those are both my favourite stoves and my favourite pans. It's been a glorious evening on Dartmoor this evening. I've really enjoyed making this video. Although there have been a few rain showers come through. If you liked what I'm doing, uh, please uh, give us the thumbs up. Um, I really appreciate subscribers. I'm not monetized or anything like that. I just do this to try and share some knowledge with other people. Uh, if you've got comments, leave comments and I'll always get back to you. Thanks ever so much for watching. And don't forget, in addition to our regular wild camping videos, Thursday evenings are outdoors inspiration, outdoor essential evenings. We're going to look at equipment, we're going to look at sleeping bags, we're going to look at sleeping systems, we're going to look at tents, we're going to look at cooking systems, we're going to look at food, how to prepare food, and we're going to look at hard skills, how to navigate, night navigation, that sort of thing. Join us on Thursday evenings for that, join us for our regular wild camping videos as well, and please don't forget, subscribe. Thank you ever so much, folks. I'm going to have a brew. I think a nice hot chocolate since I've been out here talking about stoves all evening. Come on then, Petra. Onwards and upwards. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. Hey. <laughs> Come on, time to go home. <laughs>